Folks, good to be here. Good to be here. Another opportunity to study the Word. Got some folks visiting from Alabama this morning. Good to have them with us. Preached revival in Alabama one time. We had a good meeting down there. Uh, I want you to turn with me in your Bible this morning to the book of Luke chapter 16, verse 16. Father, I pray that you'd give me the gift of teaching now this morning and give me the unction that I need, Lord. I need wisdom, Father, from thee. I don't want to lead people astray. Help me with this now, in Jesus' name, amen. All right, now, in Luke chapter number 16 and verse 16, the scripture says, The law and the prophets were until John... Since that time the kingdom of God is preached, and every man presseth into it. All right, now, if you'll remember, this, uh, obviously this is the Lord speaking. I have one of these red-letter Bibles. I don't know if you do or not. Some folks don't believe they have a Bible unless it's red-letter. You know, either way, that's not an issue with me. But here's the Lord speaking, and he says, The law and the prophets were until John, but since that time. Now, what does that say? That, that's a simple statement. It says that there is definitely a period that starts and ends somewhere and something else picks up and moves on from there. Right. And that is why in studying the scripture, I am compelled to be a dispensationalist. And uh, the reason for that is because all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable, but all scripture does not apply to the same people at the same time. And this is the key to understanding New Testament. You remember I told you that there's a key, like the keystone I mentioned over the window. You get the key, and the key will help you because everything relates to that key in one fashion or another, and it's what opens up the New Testament. And I told you what the key was to the New Testament. It's the Jew. And if you can get the Jew in the rightful place, then everything else will begin to fall where it should. For example, look over here in the book of Romans, chapter number 11. Romans chapter number 11, verse 1. I say then, hath God cast away his people? Now who are his people? God forbid, for I am also, see, I am also an Israelite, the seed of Abraham, the tribe of Benjamin. Look at chapter number 9 of, of Romans. Verse 1, I say the truth in Christ, I lie not, my conscience bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost, that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. For I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. Now the apostle introduced something here to you in chapter number 9. He continues on in chapter number 10 and develops it in chapter 11. These three chapters right here in the book of Romans are very important because it relates to Israel. You notice what there's no way you can, you can misunderstand. Verse 4, Hebrew, uh, Romans 9, 4. Who are Israelites to whom pertaineth the adoption, glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, and the service of God, and the promises. Now, he wished, this is an honest and sincere prayer from the Apostle Paul saying that he would himself be cursed of God if he could see his brethren saved. Now what's that mean? That means he became an intercessor. That's what that means. He took the place of the one that he was praying for. By doing so, he becomes an intercessor. Now, the 10th chapter of the book of Romans, verse 1, My heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel, they might be saved. For I bear them record, they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. Now is there any way, having read 9 and 10, can we, can we ram the church in here? You can't do it. And that's the only way you could do it, is to ram it in here and displace the rightful owner of this. All right. So when he gets to the 11th chapter in verse 1, you notice the progression of his thought. Look at the progression. I say then, hath God cast away his people? God forbid. For I am also an Israelite 
of the seed of Abraham, the tribe of Benjamin, God hath not cast away his people, which he foreknew. Watch ye not what the scripture saith of Elias, how he maketh intercession to God against Israel, saying, They have killed thy prophets, dig down thine altars, now I am left alone, and they seek my life. So the apostle Paul, without question, is talking about the future state of Israel and of the Israelites. And now when you get to the 11th chapter of the book of Romans, and you look over here in verse number, uh, verse number 32. Romans eleven thirty-two. 32. For God hath concluded them all in unbelief that he might have mercy upon all. Now, the def now the, that's a very controversial all. See, that's very controversial. What does he mean? Does he mean all that are alive at the coming of Christ? All that have lived from a time of Christ until the second advent? All who believe and see the, the second advent and, and uh, when he comes in clouds of glory and receive him? Because there are those Jews who will not. So what is the definition of this all? How do you define it? But look at verse 32. Oh, the depths of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. What is this? This is a man rejoicing. This is a man rejoicing over the ones that he'd been crying about, burdened about. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, or who hath been his counselor, or who hath first given to him, and it should be recompensed him again? For of him, through him, to him are all things, to whom be glory forever. Amen. So what does this mean then, preacher? It means that the Jew, if you can get the Jew right, you can get the New Testament right. Look at Acts 28 now. Acts chapter number 28, verse number 25. Acts 28, 25. And when they agreed not among themselves, they who? Go back and you look and you'll see he's talking to the Jews. Verse number 23. He persuaded them concerning Jesus out of the law of Moses. That wouldn't have been a thing to a Gentile. And out of the prophets from morning till evening. Some believed the things which were spoken, some believed not. Acts 28, 24. And when they agreed not among themselves, they departed after that Paul had spoken one word. And he quotes Isaiah 6. Well spake the Holy Ghost by Isaiah the prophet, saying to our fathers, Go unto this people and say, Hearing ye shall hear and shall not understand, seeing ye shall see and not perceive. For the heart of this people is waxed gross, and their ears are dull of hearing. Their eyes have they closed, lest they should see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their heart. And should be converted, and I should heal them. Be it known therefore unto you that the salvation of God is sent to the churches. No, to the Gentiles, and they'll hear it. So what you have here is quoting Isaiah 6. If you remember, I told you last week how that Isaiah chapter number 6 is so very, very important because it's quoted on three different occasions in the New Testament. In Isaiah, it's quoted in Matthew chapter 13, verse 14. And I told you about Bullinger's notes on this, Ethelbert Bullinger. And this is to refresh you, and some of you weren't in here last week, but it's to refresh your mind so you'll be able to follow on with us as we move into this. He quotes, uh, the New Testament quotes Isaiah chapter number 6 seven times, three times, when a, when, a, when, a, when a very important event has just happened as it relates to Israel. In Matthew chapter 13, Bullinger says, it's quoted by Christ as coming from Jehovah on the day a council was held to destroy him. Israel now had taken an official position that the Lord Jesus Christ was, the, was, a, was a illegitimate, demon-possessed uh, usurper trying to usurp the throne of Messiah. And that's exactly what the Babylonian Talmud bears him out to be. In coded form, the whole thing. If you want to use a document that is ancient to prove the existence of Christ, the Babylonian Talmud will do the job. It wasn't designed to do that, but the very fact that they come against him time and time and time again proves he lived along with Josephus of course, and uh, Pliny and Tacitus and a few others. So here we have 
a quotation of Isaiah 6 by Christ when he is, when he is, when he, a council is held to destroy him and an application is made. You remember what happens right after that? Notice carefully. Matthew chapter 13, verse number 14. Look at Matthew chapter number 13, verse number 3. They've had the council, and look what happens. Matthew chapter 13 and verse number 3. And he spake many things unto them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went forth to sow. Now, if you'll do a concordance check on your New Testament, I believe you'll find that that's the first time parable shows up in Matthew. And the first time that parable shows up in Matthew is directly connected with the official leadership of Israel rejecting him and deciding to destroy him. So what are we talking about then? It go, the kingdom of heaven that is offered to the Jews goes into a parabolic state. The parable is designed to blind the eyes of some and open the eyes of others. That's the purpose of a parable. And he now has already begun to blind them because they have rejected him. The second time that Isaiah chapter number 6 is quoted is in, uh, is in John chapter number 12. By Christ is coming from the Messiah in his glory after a council is taken to put him to death. And then the third time that Isaiah chapter number 6 is quoted is uh, in reference to a, to a, to a very important event is by Paul is coming from the Holy Ghost when after a whole day's conference they believed not. Acts chapter 28, verse 25, which we just read. Now, how many of you are following along with me here on this thing? This is important. It's very important. Here the New Testament writers are quoting an Old Testament prophecy and they're making an application in the New Testament to it. There's, no better, there's nothing better than that. There is nothing better than to have a New Testament writer quote the Old Testament and apply it. See what I mean? Nobody can come along today and say it's arbitrary. Come along and say, well, that's in your interpretation. Leave the book to, in to interpret itself. When they start making application, then I'm going, to, I'm going to listen. Because we have inspired prophets, we have inspired writers, and what we're going to get from them is a revelation from God. So, we have the Jew blinded. All right? We have the kingdom of heaven offered. And the kingdom of heaven rejected. We've got four gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and then John. We have three gospels that are commonly referred to as synoptic gospels. The word synopsis means sin come together many views, but they have one optic. In other words, many different points of view, but they all come together with the same picture. That's a synoptic gospel. But John is not one of the synoptic gospels. The reason John is not is because it's no, if you read the Bible at all, you'll find John's different. Amen. So different that there has been a dogfight for, uh, for some time, the first couple of centuries after Christ, as to whether it should even belong in the canon of Scripture. These 27 books that you have in the New Testament, and Matthew through Revelation, were not accepted by all, all Christians automatically. You know, they just sat down, this is the canon. Didn't work that way. It was the work of the Holy Spirit of God witnessing to these scriptures and the lives of these people that lived in the first and second century after Christ. For example, the Syriac Peshito, which dates back to about 180 A.D. that I mentioned to the fellow who stood up the other day and said the Bible's full of errors. You remember him? Talking about all the contradictions? Well, we had a little talk after that outside, and he came back, and we had a talk about it, and he started talking about all of these contradictions and all of this and all of that. And I said to him, well, what about the Syriac Peshito that was written about 180, 160 to 180 A.D.? I knew I had him right then. He'd never heard of it. I thought to myself, but this is so sad because you're basing your soul on a bunch of garbage that you've read from liberal theologians who have rejected the canonicity of the Scripture, the, the development of the Scripture, had never heard the Syriac Peshito. Folks, the Syriac Peshito has the books that he said are spurious, that didn't exist, that were created later. There's just a bunch of junk. They're in that. 
and they're in the first 200 years after Christ. That's a big deal. That's a very big deal because one of the arguments of an agnostic and atheist when you deal with him about the transmission of the scripture is this. They're going to say, well, you know, uh, who really knows if Matthew wrote Matthew and who, wrote, who knows if Luke wrote Luke and John wrote John and all of this. They start casting doubt in your mind. So he Xeroxed some pages from a, from a, from a book and, and left that with me. And instead of answering any of the questions personally, he just Xeroxed some pages from a book. And I read it. It's in the same old party line. When they start talking about this stuff and creating this fabrication about how the Bible developed, they never quote any primary sources. Are you following me? No primary sources. It's all, it's all a conjecture about how it came to being. If you're going to tell me that Matthew didn't write Matthew, show me how, how, how you know that Matthew didn't write Matthew. Amen. All right? Right? If you're going to tell me that the Apostle John did not write John, all right, show me. You know, show me. And this is what you get into with this thing. Because if he can destroy your faith in the inspiration of the scriptures, then close the doors and go home. Because we are people of the book. And I believe the book is the inspired word of God. The book has changed my life. The book, holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. No prophecy of the scriptures of any private interior. Holy men of God did not speak, did not write, did not preach, did not prophesy because of some whim they felt. They were moved upon. The Bible said all scriptures given by inspiration, theos noustos, God breathed. God breathed the scripture. But anyway, when you get into the canon of scripture, the last book in the New Testament is the book of Revelation. Whether that's the last book written in the New Testament, you can't prove it one way or another because nobody can prove the date of any New Testament book as specifically it was written on this date. You can't do it. Don't bother with them. Nobody can prove that Matthew was written 150 A.D., like some of the liberals like to say, or it was written 60 A.D., or it was written 80 A.D. You can't prove that. You can't prove the writing of the date. The date of the writing, you can't prove it. But the Apostle John outlived every one of these apostles. And he was exiled on the Isle of Patmos. They took John, put him in a huge container, and boiled him in oil, expecting to kill John, do away with him. Guess what? He lived. Now, whether that actually happened or not, I don't know. But that's what they teach, that they tried to do away with John. John lived out his days according to the prophecy of Christ. He said he would be an old man. John completes the canon of Scripture. And he completes it by writing the book of Revelation. But he also writes the gospel of John. And he writes 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. Now there's something about John. There's something different about him. Because John's gospel does not fit with Matthew, Mark, and Luke in the same sense that they do when they're talking about the kingdom of heaven. The gospel of John never mentions the kingdom of heaven one time. Not once. Not one time. But it sure talks about the kingdom of God. And it's a remarkable thing, don't you think? That the gospel of John is the only gospel that says you must be born again. That's a big deal. Do you know why? Because the gospel of John is not a Jewish book. It's a book written to the church of God, Jew and Gentile. It's written to the expanse of mankind. It's written for whosoever will, let him come and take of the water of life freely. It's not about a Jewish kingdom and a Jewish throne. It's about none of that. It's about, he said, these things are written that ye might believe. And the apostle John said, I suppose if all the things Christ said or did were written, the world couldn't contain the books of all the things. So obviously from that, there's a lot more going on here. So now what does that say? Well, that says that there's a development taking place. And I want to try to show you that development. I want to try to show you that. Look over here with me in the book of Matthew, chapter number 11, verse 14. Matthew eleven fourteen. 14.
Now, if you look at all this, look at verse 13, Matthew eleven thirteen. 13. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until who? All right. Now go back and look at verse 12. These are powerful scriptures. And from the days of John the Baptist till now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. See that? Then all the prophets and the law prophesied till John. Is there a counterpart in Luke that we just read, 1616? The law and the prophets were until John. Since that kind time the kingdom of God is preached, every man presseth into it. Same reference. Now look what follows. Verse 14. And if ye will receive it, this is Elias, which was for to come. Boy, he drops one and on that one now. What's that mean? The law and the prophets were until John. Cut off point. Kingdom of heaven suffereth violence. Violent take it by force. Reach and take it. Now think about this for a minute. If the kingdom of heaven is a spiritual kingdom, is the same as the kingdom of God, how in the world could an unsaved man take the kingdom of God? How could he reach in there and jerk it by violence and force? See, now I've got brethren I love and respect greatly, but they say there is no difference between the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God. They're dead wrong. There's a big difference between the two. The kingdom of heaven is a visible, physical kingdom. The kingdom of God is a spiritual kingdom. And the Lord said in John 3, except you're born again, you can't even see it. Amen. How could they take it? Amen. Amen. See, how could they take it by force? You can't even see it. You can't, you're not even conscious of its existence. See? How can you take it by force? But the kingdom of heaven, which is an earthly kingdom, that Lord was offering to the Jews if they would receive the king. He's the king. You, get, you, you accept the king, you accept the kingdom. They rejected the king, but they want the kingdom. won't work. You can't have the kingdom without the king. See? So he said it will be taken for you and given to another people. All right. So the kingdom suffereth violence. The violent take it by force. Well, who's going to take it by force? The God of this world. For he has a legal right until Revelation chapter number 11, verse 15 where it says the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. That's when he comes to take that kingdom which is rightfully his. But until that time comes, the God of this world had the kingdom handed to him on a silver platter by Adam. Yes, because the Lord gave Adam the kingdom and said, have dominion over the fish of the sea and the fowl of the air. Yes, the first man, Adam, was made of the earth, earthy, and he handed him an earthly kingdom. And he, uh, and he rejected it. He lost it. I want you to look at something over here for just a moment. I hadn't planned to do this, but turn to Genesis 1.1. This has always been a, a thing that, uh, that kind of, it, 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 all, it all make you go home and think. Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. All right. Elohim hashamayim haaretz. That's the Hebrew here, okay? Haaretz is the earth. Hashamayim is the heaven. Now, a Hebrew word that ends in im is a plural Hebrew noun. How many's ever heard of Elohim? <laughs> All right, that means three or more. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost. Elohim. El is short for Elohim. It is a plural Hebrew noun. Now, Hebrew's got something English doesn't have. So what's that? Dual. English has singular and plural. Hebrew has singular, dual, and plural. Plural means not two, but three or more. But why did they translate a plural Hebrew noun in a singular noun? Is that heavens or heaven in your Bible? What? Heaven. In the beginning, God created, didn't say the heavens, did he? said the heaven and the earth. Now, does God need heaven to dwell in? No. Did God, does God need anything? No. Where was he in eternity past before anything was ever created? Abiding in his own element. He's God. And, he's, and there's a point you get to where forget it. Don't try to think any further. You can't handle it. That's the way I do. Forget it. <laughs> forget it. Can't handle it. I just accept he's the almighty he needs nothing. He's from everlasting to everlasting. If there is a heaven, he created it. He didn't create it for himself. He created it for you. All right. 
So, you know, a reason I say that is because it makes me think there's something going on here in Genesis 1.1. You know, it doesn't talk about heavens, but it just talks about heaven. And uh, it's translated heaven. Now, the King James translators, and I don't know if the NIV and the rest of these Bibles, I don't know what they have in there. Does anybody have one of them? <laughs> That's a loaded question, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah, I got one. <laughs> oh, Lord. Uh, anyway, <laughs> the, uh, you know, if you, I don't, go ahead and get home if you have one. Look it up. See what it says in Genesis 1 1. Yes. See what it says. And if it says heavens, plural, then uh, see if you can find a notation on that. See if you can find why they translated it in the plural and the King James translators translated it in the singular. Do you think the KJV translators knew that was a plural Hebrew noun? Okay. All right. All right. Hebrew 1-1, you learn that, okay? Hebrew 101, you learn that. That's a plural Hebrew noun. But they didn't translate it in, uh, in plural. They translated it singular. So that's one of those things that make you go home and think. That'd be your homework assignment for the week. Next Sunday morning, we'll take up the papers and see what you found out and do a little research into it. And you might be surprised at what you find. Just a little simple thing like that. Yes, sir. NIV says what? My, my, my. My, my, my. All right. You remember who got that now? You remember the man that got the NIV? <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Pardon? He needs a new phone, right? <laughs> Well, I'm sure you can go online and find every translation in the world, uh, and you know you can you can compare these things. You can see how much I compare them with the other translations. I don't. I just read what the Hebrew says, you know, and it's and it's and it's and it's a plural noun. But anyway, uh, there's a reason for there's a reason for this. So, what's the reason, preacher? Maybe something was going on in Genesis 1:1 that you know it's not on the surface and doesn't meet the eye, but something could have developed after Genesis 1:1. See what I mean? Because of something that the man did when he fell. See? Something could have developed after that. So anyway, in Luke 16, 16, the law and the prophets told John, here we are in Matthew, and it says this, Matthew chapter number 12. If you will receive it, this is Elias, which was for to come. Well, now, what was Elias? Who is this? This is Elijah, of course. All right. Now, when's he supposed to come? What's he supposed to do when he comes? Anybody know where that is? That's, that's exactly right. It's the last book of the Bible. Malachi 4. These are called the, uh, this is the uh, uh, part of the Old Testament. And we've got a 400-year period here now, usually given as about 400 years, between the, the, the canon of Scripture closing in the Old Testament and the beginning of the New it's called the 400 silent years. They're not silent. There's a lot of apocryphal, Jewish apocryphal books that are written during this period of time. And some of them, I think, have legitimate history, like Maccabees. I believe that's legitimate history. But anyway, Malachi chapter number 4, verse 4. Remember ye the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded him in Horeb for all Israel and for the statutes and judgments. Now watch this. Behold, I will send you Elijah. All right. The prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children, the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth. The last word in the Old Testament. What is it? Curse. All right. Last word in the book of Genesis or last thing in Genesis. A coffin in Egypt. All right. Now, what is Elijah doing here? This is not for the church. This is Elijah directly relating to what he's going to do for Israel. And what's he going to do? He's going to turn the heart of the fathers to children, the children of the fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. All right. You've got Elijah the prophet prophesied to come. Will he come? Yes, he'll come. Yes, he'll come. Absolutely. He'll come. Who was it on top of that mountain of transfiguration? All right. Who? 
Since they didn't have any photographs back then, how do you reckon they knew who they were? Spirit. Spirit revealed them. All right. The Bible told you what Elijah looked like anyway. The old hairy man, the Old Testament, locust and honey. And you know, it's a lot like John the Baptist. Very, very similar to John the Baptist, wasn't he? Amen. Weren't he? This is what the Lord said. If you will receive it, look at Matthew chapter number 12, verse 12. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. That's the two divisions of the Jewish Old Testament, which comprises, which, which is comprised of three divisions. The law, the prophets, and the writings, all right? For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. If ye will receive it, this is Elias, which was for to come. Receive what? John the Baptist. That's what. Receive him as who? Elias. Number one. It means that a man can stand for another man. It means that God can fulfill his prophecy in an individual that represents another individual. Amen. It means that John the Baptist could have fulfilled the prophecy of the coming of Elijah. Yes. Number one. Number two, if John the Baptist had fulfilled the prophecy of the coming of Elijah, what's going on here? See what I mean? Amen. What's going on? All right. There's got to be something happening. Look at Matthew chapter number 17, verse 10. Matthew chapter 17, verse 10. Now, this is a genuine question. This is a question from people who read their Bible. And uh, look carefully at what's going on here. Matthew, uh, Matthew 17, verse 10. His disciples asked him, saying... Why then say the scribes that Elias must first come? That's a good question, right? We just read it, that Elias must first come. Look at what he says, verse 11. Jesus answered and said unto them, Elias truly shall first come and restore all things. Now watch this. But I say unto you that Elias is come already. And they knew him not, but have done unto him whatsoever they listed. Likewise shall also the Son of Man suffer of them. Then the disciples understood that he spake unto them of John the Baptist. So this is obvious. This is not something I'm trying to interject in here. That's what it says. Amen. So there's no doubt, it shouldn't be any doubt in anyone's mind that John the Baptist could have been Elijah. Right? Amen. And the coming of Elijah would be the coming for Israel, not the church. Amen. And John the Baptist was the, was the preacher of Israel, preaching Israel to make the way of the coming of the Son of Man, the forerunner, right? Amen. Yes, he was. But the way God lays out dispensations, only God can do, where he says something is going to happen, but he can change it and make something else happen and still fulfill the same prophecy. Yes, That's what's going on here. Right? It sure is. Now go to the book of Acts with me. The book of Acts. You know Acts is, uh, this is a record now here, right after the, the resurrection of Christ. And we know it hadn't been long at all. And uh, in the book of Acts, chapter number 3, Verse 19, Acts 3, 19. Now Luke wrote Acts. All right, Luke wrote Acts. Matthew, Levi, the publican, wrote Matthew. Mark wrote Mark. John wrote John. Now I believe that. I have no problem at all believing that. I don't subscribe to this Q document and this document and this document and somebody later on scribe put it all together. Don't buy that. Matthew, uh, Acts chapter number 3 verse 19. Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out. When? 
and he shall send Jesus Christ, which before preached to you. Now hold on a minute. What if I got up here and told people, now repent and be converted and come down here and get right with God, but your sins are not going to be blotted out until the second advent? You'd say, now hold on, preacher. <laughs> Something's not right here. Amen. Look at that carefully. What does it say? It's talking about a future event, right? Okay, and notice carefully. If you try to ram the church in here, See, you see the mess that these replacement theology gets into when they try to, say, when every time they say Israel, they say church. Yes, they get in trouble, boy. They get in trouble fast. There's no way you can put the church in here. But what you do have here is Israel. And what you have here is a remarkable thing. For when Peter got up and preached on the day of Pentecost, he was not preaching to a bunch of Gentiles. In other words, the Gentile. Uh, the gen like we preach to Gentiles in the church, you had, you had all these different proselytes, some of them no doubt Gentiles, but we're not talking about a Gentile church like we know it. He's up there preaching. And he said, ye men of Israel. All right. What we have here in Acts chapter number two and three is an offer again to the children of Israel to receive the Messiah. It's a second offer. Even after they had rejected him the first time, being the apple of God's eye, folks, the chosen people, the ancient people, the one to whom the, 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 uh, the, uh, the oracles of God been committed, he offers them another opportunity, not individually. Individual salvation is all in the Bible. This is collective body. This is a collective group. This represents the whole nation of Israel. Ye men of Israel, he had given them another opportunity. Another one. And what happens here in the first few chapters of the book of Acts? Immediately, the scribes and the Pharisees, the chief priests and all of them, they do the same thing they had done before. Right? They took the apostles and, and beat them and, uh, and told them, do not preach in this man's name and you're going to bring his blood on our hands and, and the latter end is going to be worse than the beginning. And all of this stuff, and they were trying their dead level best to stamp out the early faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. They were doing it. Yet, in the spite of all of that, he was offering them the kingdom again. And there's no way you can understand this scripture except by saying, this has got to be a future event, is it? Let's look at it again, verse 19. Repent ye therefore and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out. When the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord, and he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you, which the heaven whom the heaven must receive until the time of restitution of all things, which God hath spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. This is loaded. This is a powerful scripture because he goes back and quotes Moses even the Lord your God shall raise up unto thee a prophet like unto me. Moses was a prophet, Deuteronomy 32. Unlike any other prophet in the Old Testament up until that point, Moses wrote the Pentateuch, wrote the first five books of the Bible. God said, I'll speak to you through visions and through this, but to Moses I'll speak face to face. So Moses was different. And he, uh, and he, and he here says that there's going to become a time of restitution and your sins will be blotted out. Now ask yourself a question this morning. Was this individual sin or was this national collective sin for rejecting Christ? That's right. Think about that. There's a, there's, a, there's a type in the Old Testament where if a body is found out in the field, that body is found out in the field, nobody knows what happened. Nobody knows if somebody, you know, if it was, if it was an accident, somebody killed him, whatever. They don't know. God had such a sense to teach his people, teaching them the, teaching them consciousness about killing and dying. He made a difference between murder and manslaughter. All of these things are throughout the Old Testament. You know, in a time of where people are living like dogs, crucifying each other, killing each other, yet he's teaching Israel, don't shed innocent blood. So you find this body out in the field. So what do you do? You go to the elders of the city. You go to the elders of the nearest town. And you bring those elders out there in that field 
to where you find that dead body and those elders stand over that dead body and proclaim, we are not accountable for this innocent blood. We do not know how this happened and they are absolved of responsibility. So the Lord Jesus comes back. His body has been found in the field and the elders of Israel are going to have to come out in mass and they're going to have to give an account as to how this innocent man died. And when they come out to give an account as to how this innocent man died, they're going to have blood on their hands. The Old Testament prophet said, where did you get these wounds? In the house of my friends. Blood. Pilate said, let me wash the blood from my hand. Even a Roman, even a Roman understood the difference between blood guiltiness and innocence. He said, I'm innocent of the blood of this just man. Amen. So the blood guiltiness, in the book of Hebrews, he said, the, your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. Abel's blood speaketh from the ground. So what's that mean? That means when the second coming takes place, the Lord Jesus comes and appears to the Jew. They're going to look upon him as one that mourneth for his only son. They're going to say, where did you get these wounds? He said, in the house of my friends. You are the one that we've read about in the Talmud. You are the one that we have rejected as being our Messiah. You are the true Messiah, the Lord God, the King of Israel. And they'll get on their hands and their knees and they'll repent of their collective guilt for crucifying the Lord of glory. That's as a body. See, that's as a body. And, uh, and, but individually, they each individual, individually, they must accept him or reject him as their Messiah, their Lord, and their Savior. So when does salvation come for Israel? When he roars out of Zion, salvation comes to Israel at the second advent, at the second coming. He is salvation. And they will accept him then when they see him. And they'll see him as he is. Amen. And so they'll be absolved of guilt. Once absolved of guilt, they'll be elevated to the highest place among all the nations. They'll sit in Jerusalem. Christ will and reign for a thousand years. And the Jews will all be placed in their place in the land there for that thousand year period of time. And the church of God, that's us. We'll be reigning with him for a thousand years on this earth. In that kingdom, when the kingdoms of this earth have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. And that time's going to come. But this world will never yield it up voluntarily. That's why he'll have to take it. Amen. Because right now the kingdom is taken by force. When you have, when you have uh, 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 ambassadors, they sit at tables and they use scripted language and they appear so benevolent to each other. The bottom line is they believe that God is on the side of the one that has the biggest guns. That's what they believe. My grandfather used to sing a song when I was a kid. He said, praise the Lord and pass the ammunition. <laughs> oh, yeah. In World War I, the uh, horrible trench warfare that developed there and... Uh, one Christmas they took a break and the men came out of their trenches, the Germans and the British, they came out of their trenches, they went out and shook hands with each other and they celebrated Christmas. They sure did. That happened. That happened. Now the officers scorned on it, but the men said, enough of this killing, I don't even know these guys I'm killing. And they came up out of these trenches and they shook hands with each other and they celebrated Christmas. It's not the people fighting the wars, folks. It's the people in power that fights the wars. That's who does the fighting. Of course, they're not the ones who shed the blood, but they're the ones who are, who are pushing the agenda. And they're crying, peace, peace, and there's no peace. There'll be no peace till the prince comes, the prince of peace. All right, we'll pick it up again next week. And uh, maybe I'll try to tie this together for you about Elijah becoming, about John the Baptist becoming Elijah. What's that going to do? What's, what's the purpose of that? How does that fit in? See, that's, that's a big deal. That's a big deal. Why? It's contingent. There's some contingencies going on here. 
And that's what we need to see. All right, let's have a word of prayer. Brother Ryan Rowland, will you dismiss us, please? Use your, use your man, give us the, the word today.